Welcome to the Introduction to Lee Theory course. This is the very first lecture. So I'm going to start out with kind of a chapter zero. Uh, and the goal of chapter zero is to answer the question, why Lie algebras? Mm, so I've, I've taught this course a few times. And uh, in the past, I've always started out from the very beginning by focusing on Lie algebras and narrowly only teaching about Lie algebras. Uh, and indeed, that's going to be the main topic We're going to study finite dimensional, semi simple Lie algebras. Actually, we're going to study them just over the field C of complex numbers. But let me see. Uh, always, I'm going to be talking about algebras, and they'll always mean K algebras. for some field K. And the thing is that as soon as we start doing Lie algebras properly, K will actually be the field of complex numbers. But in this general stuff at the beginning, it doesn't matter. Any field will, will, be, will be good. OK, so uh, what is a Lie algebra? Let me tell you that. A Lie algebra is a vector space, and you usually use the notation G, this kind of strange German font G, plus a bilinear map. Okay, so it's an algebra, so it's a vector space with a bilinear multiplication. And that bilinear map is usually denoted by these square brackets. So that's a bilinear map from G cross G to G. And then there's axioms. There's just two axioms. The first axiom is the anti-symmetry, which just says that the bracket XX is zero for all X in G. And of course, anti-symmetry, I'm sure you're familiar with this anti-symmetry, that, that property that xx is zero implies that xy is minus yx, which is why it's called anti-symmetry. Uh, so you just plug in, instead of x in my, uh, in my axiom, just plug in x plus y and expand, and you'll see that that implies what I said it implies. So that's the first axiom. And the second axiom is called the Jacobi identity, which is a little longer to write down. Let me see. So it's the bracket of x with the bracket of y and z. And then you have to kind of cyclically permute x, y, and z. So I, I replace x by y. I replace y by z and z with x. And then you cyclically permute again. So z goes to x, x goes to y. That sum is zero, and this is for all x, y, and z in the vector space G. Uh, so that's the definition of Lie algebra, and it really didn't take me very long to make that definition. OK, uh, so let's see. I think we already need to see an example. So for an example, let A be any associative algebra. OK, so that's the usual thing that you're used to, a, a, an algebra with a, a unital algebra with an associative multiplication. Uh, and uh, so as usual, I'll write that multiplication just as uh, x, y, just by uh, putting x and y next to each other, so just as a, as a normal multiplication. And then if you define square brackets x, y to be the commutator, then 
then this makes the, the, the given associative algebra into a Lie algebra. So this uh, commutator, this square bracket, satisfies anti-symmetry. That's, that's totally obvious. And it satisfies uh, Jacobi. Well, that's a little bit less obvious, so let me kind of explain how you prove that this satisfies jo Jacobi. So the first thing you have to observe is that if you take the bracket of x with a product, that's equal to the bracket of x and y times z plus y times the bracket of x and z. So that's a, a, a fairly easy little silly check. You just write out the definition of the bracket as a commutator and uh, you rapidly see that those two uh, sides of that identity are equal. And then once you've got that, you can check that the bracket of x with, with not the associative product yz, but this new Lie product, this commutator, has the same property. Okay, so you you first check this property for the associative product y times z, and then using that you check this identity for the uh, new product, this Lie bracket y z. So I you see I'm starting to drop my commas. Let me put some commas back in. There we go. Uh, and the latter is easily rewritten to give the Jacobi identity. Yeah, so that, that's kind of how that check goes, that this uh, commutator makes an associative algebra into a Lie algebra. It's in no way deep. So there's a few little comments here. Uh, so uh, this property here says that the linear map D from our algebra to our algebra sending... Uh, let me see, uh, what do I want to do? Sending A to the, the commutator XA. Maybe I should call it D sub X because it depends on a, an element X of the vector space A. It says that this linear map is what's called a derivation of the associative algebra. So derivation, that's, that's, the, Leibniz, that's the Leibniz rule. I guess you're used to that, calling that the product rule as well. Right, so let's look at this identity. So this is the, uh, the dx, dx of a product. It's dx of the first guy times the second plus the first guy times dx of the second. Right, so that's exactly the usual Leibniz rule for differentiating a product. Okay, so that, that's why I wrote that down. It's saying taking the commutator that defines a derivation of this associative algebra. And in fact, this uh, Jacobi identity here, uh, which is equivalent to my, my uh, second property, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it says simply that dx from our Lie algebra to our Lie algebra, sending an element a to the commutator, to, to the Lie bracket xa, is a derivation of the Lie algebra. G. Okay, so so this Leibniz rule, which is which you normally write like this, it's equivalent to this rule, which is saying that dx of the Lie bracket y z is dx of y Lie bracketed with z, and then y Lie bracketed with dx of z. Okay, so that's the Jacobi identity. Really, the right way to think about it is it's saying that this uh, operation, dx, taking the Lie bracket with x, is a derivation of this as a Lie algebra. Okay, so anyway, that is uh, everything I want to say about the definition of Lie algebra. Maybe I should have one example here. Um, so... Uh, uh, well, let's, let's put that on the next page because this is getting a bit cluttered.
For example, you can take the associative algebra A to be mn of k, the associative algebra of n by n matrices under matrix multiplication, then uh, the above construction turning A into a Lie algebra produces what's called the Lie algebra. So it's not it's not denoted Mn of K, that's the notation for matrices viewed as an associative algebra, is denoted GLN of K in this fancy German font. So this is the general linear Lie algebra. So that's going to be a super important example. Um, but uh, I always think at this point, um, that the uh, definition of Lie algebra should probably seem quite unmotivated the way I just gave it. I mean, why on earth is it important to look at the uh, uh, structures with these two properties, anti-symmetry and the Jacobi identity? Uh, and uh, um, um, what I'm really going to do is I'm going to spend probably the first two weeks um, talking instead about about uh, groups. Um, and uh, my with my goal of, for doing this to explain why Lie algebras and the point is that Lie algebras are going to arise as linearized groups uh, and Linear things are much easier to study, so so uh, that that that's that's kind of the the idea here. So I didn't say what sort of groups, and you should put your favorite out adjectives here. So you know, if you're an undergraduate, you might put the adjective finite. Here and you would be talking about finite groups. If you're um, a topologist, you might put the words compact Lie here, and you would study compact Lie groups. If you're an analyst, you might put the words locally compact and study locally compact groups. Uh, finite groups, you, I'm sure you, you, you know lots about finite groups. Compact Lie groups are things like uh, the circle S1 or the group SO3. Uh, 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 the first example of a locally compact group that I think you come across in analysis is the real numbers under addition. Um, but I'm an algebraist. And so the word I put here is the word algebraic. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to study algebraic groups for a couple of weeks. Um, and um, I'm going to try to show you that Lie algebras come out of algebraic groups by linearizing them. So let me see. I think I can squeeze in one more thing here, uh, which is the uh, main idea of Lie theory. So this is kind of the philosophy and everything that's going on. Well, Lie algebras are easy because they're linear. Linear things, you have tools from linear algebra you can use to study them. 
okay, so Lie algebra is easy, and uh, we're going to see that Lie algebras arise by linearizing algebraic groups. In fact, there's a very close connection. between the structure of, well, you need to add an adjective, a connected algebraic group. And for this connection to be tight, you really need to be working over the complex numbers and its Lie algebra. So that's really what I'm kind of going to try to tell you about. I, I'm not really trying to tell you about uh, algebraic groups in in any real depth. I'm I'm really just trying to tell you about uh, uh, what they are in this linearization process, so that you get a glimpse of this philosophy. And I think everyone will agree algebraic groups are clearly a motivated and natural thing to study, since you can study algebraic groups by linearizing them, turning them into Lie algebras, and Lie algebras are easy, this uh, tight connection means that this is a very useful thing to do. So uh, that's uh, what, I'm, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm up to. I'm answering the question, why Lie algebras? And the answer is algebraic groups. And so now I'm going to try to define algebraic groups and uh, explain this linearization process. Basically, I'm going to try to teach you how to differentiate to go from an algebraic group to a Lie algebra. Um, the thing is, um, I mean, at the beginning today, I wrote down the definition of Lie algebra. It took about four lines. It was extremely easy. Unfortunately, the definition of algebraic group is uh, much more difficult. So somehow, uh, uh, well, you see, as I said, Lie algebras are easy. The definition of Lie algebras was very easy. I'm afraid algebraic groups, being nonlinear things, are really rather difficult, and the definition takes some effort. And, and the reason why it's much more difficult is because the definition rests on some language from algebraic geometry. Uh, so um, I guess I've got to start, really, I mean, I want to tell you about algebraic groups. Actually, I want to tell you about Lie algebras. But to tell you why Lie algebras, I need to tell you about algebraic groups. And the problem is, to tell you about algebraic groups, I need to know some algebraic geometry. Now, I'm, I'm really not trying to go very far into the theory of algebraic groups. So we don't need very much algebraic geometry. We really just need notions related to affine varieties. And algebraic geometry gets much more interesting when you go to more general, for example, projective varieties. Um, but um, um, for affine varieties, it's really not too bad. Uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to, let me just give you a summary of these. Uh, hopefully you've seen a little bit of this language before. Uh, uh, and uh, this summary will just remind you of things if you, if you took a, algebra sequence, then, then you probably encountered just the, these basic notions, which is really all I need, because I'm just trying to give you enough of a glimpse of algebraic geometry to tell you what algebraic groups are, uh, to tell you why Lie algebras. Okay, so uh, the rest of this lecture, then, I'm just going to talk about the uh, background that we need from algebraic geometry. So uh, I, this is going to be kind of just a kind of a, a lightning tour of, of the basic notions from algebraic geometry, uh, which 
you should just treat as a black box. I'm not going to try to prove anything here. This is meant to just be some introductory material to motivate our study of Lie algebras. And when we get to Lie algebras, I'll be carefully proving everything. But uh, for the motivation, I think you'll, you'll give me a little leeway in, in giving detailed proofs. And, and especially from algebraic geometry, I'm not going to prove anything at all. Uh, so we need a field, and I'm going to assume that our field is algebraically closed. And as I said earlier, in fact, usually our field will be the complex numbers. And then we need the idea of an affine variety. So an affine variety X is a set. It's not just a set. There's also a given specified part of the data finitely generated algebra. Algebra, remember, means K algebra, where K is the field that we're working over. So you're given a set X plus a specified finitely generated algebra denoted K of X, which is an algebra of functions from the set X to the given field K. Okay, so let's say a little bit more about that definition because uh, um, um, it's, it's not quite uh, good enough. Um, there's, there's, there's one axiom. Okay, so it's a set X plus a specified finitely generated algebra. That, that property of being finitely generated, that's going to be very important. That's kind of telling us we're doing algebra uh, rather than some other more complicated algebra of functions like, I don't know, continuous functions on some manifold or something. Um, uh, saying that it's an algebra of functions, that means that this given algebra k of x is a subalgebra of the algebra map x k. So this is all functions from x to the field, just under the pointwise operations. Okay, so there's an obvious way to make functions from a set to a field into an algebra over that field with the pointwise operations. So uh, this uh, algebra of all functions, because k is a field, k is commutative, so these pointwise operations make this uh, map xk into a commutative algebra too. Okay, so our k of x is automatically commutative. Uh, I've specified that it should be finitely generated. That's part, that, that's part of the condition of being an affine variety. Uh, and by the way, k of x is automatically reduced, which means it has no non-zero nilpotent elements. That's automatic. As soon as you're an algebra of functions, you're automatically a reduced algebra. Okay, so let's see, uh, what else do I need to say? K of X, by the way, is called the coordinate algebra of the affine variety X, and it's part of the data of X. Otherwise, X would just be a set, right, which is a meaningless thing. Part of the data of an affine variety is this specified coordinate algebra, this uh, finitely generated algebra of functions on X, and I haven't told you the axiom, so you're going to have to wait for the axiom. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you that in a little while. Okay, uh, 
So let's see. Uh, um, yeah, there's so much to say. So let's see if I can make a little progress. So being a finitely generated algebra, it means that that, that coordinate algebra of x, you can pick finitely many generators, n generators. And then you can consider the polynomial algebra in n indeterminates, t1, t2, up to tn, uh, and sending ti to your ith chosen generator for this coordinate algebra will uh, give you a, a, um, a surjective algebra homomorphism from that polynomial algebra to k of x. This is for some n. Uh, and uh, therefore, by the Hilbert basis theorem, which tells you that that, that that polynomial algebra is an Ethereum, you get that this uh, coordinate algebra is an Ethereum too. Remember, an Ethereum algebra means that every ideal uh, is a finitely generated ideal. We're, we're just de dealing with commutative algebras here. So an Ethereum means every ideal is finitely generated. That's... Uh, true for the polynomial ring by the Hilbert basis theorem. So it's true for any finitely generated algebra because that, that such an algebra is a quotient of the polynomial ring. Okay, great. So uh, everything's good except I haven't told you that axiom. That'll come in a little while. If x is an affine variety... You have what's called the Zariski topology. Um, in which the closed sets are the sets V of I. For ideals i of that given algebra of functions. Okay, so v of i, uh, that's the, um, the, the the vanishing set of i. By definition, it's the set of all the points in the set X such that f of X is zero for all f in that ideal. Okay, so those V of I's, they are the closed sets for this Zariski topology on X. Uh, now, uh, I, I, since I still haven't actually told you what an affine variety is, I haven't written the axiom down yet. Uh, you probably uh, won't manage to uh, prove anything at this point that this is a topology, for example. Uh, everything I'm telling you uh, is, is modulo me finishing the definition of affine variety, and I'm being rather annoying that I haven't told you that. Um, okay, so we'll carry on until the point when I think it's convenient to actually tell you what the axiom is. Mm, let's see, what else could I say? If that ideal is uh, f1 up to fn... I mean, it, it, since since uh, k of x is an Ethereum, every ideal is finitely generated. Uh, then, um, actually, v of i, the vanishing set of i, is just the vanishing set of those functions intersected. Where for a function on x, v of f, just denotes, uh, you know, that that's just uh, the points where f is zero, v of f, vanishing set of f, right? So that's just this sort of hypersurface or whatever it is defined by the equation f of x equals zero. And uh, it's quite easy to see that that if, if you have finitely many generators of your I ideal i in front of you, then v of i is just the set of common zeros of those generators. So it's the intersections of all those hypersurfaces defined by the vanishing of each of those functions. OK, 
Okay, so a little bit more notation. I'm going to let d of f, if f is a function on x in your given algebra of functions, I'm going to let d of f actually be the complement, x minus v of f. So that's all the points where f doesn't vanish, right? So that's, that's d of f, and this is called the principal open subset. So as well as uh, these, these vanishing sets, V of I or V of F, there are also these sets called D of F for any function in your algebra of functions in your coordinate algebra. So these are the principal open subsets. And uh, so um, these are open. Because it's the complement of a closed set. And uh, this property right here, that every closed set can be written as an intersection of finitely many closed sets, tells you that any open set is a finite union of principal open sets. Uh, in particular, the D of F's are a base for the Zariski topology. In fact, even better, right? Because any open set is a finite union of principal open sets. Okay, so I'm just introducing just some, some, some language and, and uh, um, this, this, is, this is quite general language. Um, an affine variety X is called irreducible if you cannot write X as X1 union X2, just union, not disjoint union, just union for proper closed subsets x1 and x2 so let me see um, um again um i haven't told you the definition of affine variety fully yet uh so uh you won't be able to prove anything that i'm telling you uh but uh, uh the variety x being irreducible is equivalent to the coordinate algebra being an integral domain Uh, let's just have one example around AN. So this is affine N space. So this is the set KN of N tuples of elements of K and the coordinate algebra of affine n space, that's the polynomial algebra in n variables where ti is the ith coordinate function. Right, so a, a polynomial in n variables is in, in the totally obvious way, it's a function of taking n tuples to scalars. So that's the coordinate algebra of affine n space and uh, um, so, so affine n space, that's kind of the, the uh, first key example. Um, and um, this polynomial algebra is, of course, an integral domain. So uh, this example is irreducible. So it has this property that you can't decompose affine n space as a union of two proper closed subspaces in the Zariski topology. 
um, you know, it's worth even even thinking in, in the special case when n is zero. That's totally totally good. A zero affine zero space. What is that? Uh, that's the set of zero to. Oh, that's just a point because there's only one zero tuple, um, the empty tuple. So affine zero space is just a point. And what's the coordinate algebra of affine zero space? Well, there's no no uh, variables t1 through tn. The coordinate algebra of the affine variety that is a point is just the ground field. Okay, so that's that's the most trivial of all affine varieties. Okay, so now let's see. Uh, the next result is the Nullstellensatz. So let me see. For this, you, you note that if you have some function on x, then the vanishing set of f is equal to the vanishing set of f squared or f cubed or whatever. And so from that, you dedu deduce that the vanishing set of an ideal is equal to the vanishing set of the radical of that ideal. And this is a radical ideal. I'm, I'm assuming that you've probably seen that definition, so I'm not going to write it out. Uh, but what does radical ideal mean? It means that the quotient algebra, the coordinate algebra, quotiented out by, the, by that ideal is reduced. It has no non-zero nil potents. And the Nullstellensatz tells you that the, uh, if you take the set of all radical ideals, I of k of x, and you look at the set of all closed sets in x with respect to the Zariski topology, that uh, these two sets are in bijection um, via the maps V and I. So these two maps are mutually inverse bijections. Uh, maybe I even add a little extra. Mutually inverse inclusion reversing bijections. And let me see, you know what V is, that's taking an ideal to its vanishing set. You may as well assume that the ideal is a radical ideal because V of I is equal to V of the radical of I. But I haven't told you what I is. Well, if you have a subset of X, uh, I of Y, that's the set of all functions in the coordinate algebra such that F of Y is zero for all y in y. So that takes a subset of x to an ideal of the coordinate algebra. It's easy to see that, in fact, that's a radical ideal. And uh, then the Nullstellensatz tells you that, the, that these two maps, v and i, are mutual inverses of each other. In particular, the set of maximal ideals M of k of x. So the proper ideals that aren't contained in any bigger proper ideal is in bijection with the actual set x. Uh, and this uh, bijection takes point x to... So, so this, this is a consequence of the Nalshalensatz, that maximal ideals correspond to points in x. So if you have a point, little x in big X, the corresponding maximal ideal is denoted m little x. And by definition, that's the kernel of what I denote by f x. So f x from k of x to k, take, it, it, this, is, this is evaluation at x. Right, so you just take a function and you and you evaluate that function on the point x. This is an algebra homomorphism, and um, so that's evaluation at x. And the kernel of that algebra homomorphism, uh, that's a maximal ideal, um, because the quotient of k of x 
by the kernel is isomorphic to the image, which is a field. Okay, so kernel of evaluation at x, that's a maximal ideal. So that's the map in this direction and uh, basically what you have to observe. So the map in the other direction, it just comes from this, uh, this, this function v. And all you really need to see is that if you take this mx, the uh, closed set defined by mx, the, the vanishing set of, of this maximal ideal mx, well, it's just exactly the set that's, that's that single point x there. Okay, so uh, again, I'm being really annoying because I didn't tell you the axiom for affine variety. Um, and I've told you all of these properties, which, which, which are all a bit meaningless because I haven't even given you the definition of affine variety. In fact, that this map is a bijection is the missing axiom. for affine variety. So I've sort of gone a bit backwards. Uh, I've told you all of these properties uh, and I've formulated this as a property, that the map sending point x to the kernel of evaluation at x is a bijection. In fact, that's where I should have started. That's the axiom, the missing axiom connecting the set x and the given algebra of functions k of x. You need that to be a bijection. And you need that uh, to kind of deduce everything else here. And uh, um, then um, saying that uh, affine n space um, is an affine variety, uh, you have to check that indeed the maximal ideals of the polynomial algebra are in bijection with the points in that space. And uh, that's also called the Nullschlellensatz. That's the classification of maximal ideals of the polynomial algebra. So, uh, um, yes, so I, I've probably done a terrible job. But remember, all I'm trying to do is give you a, a, a kind of black box list of properties of affine varieties so that we can work with them. Uh, to define algebraic groups. So I, I think uh, my terrible job is actually uh, good enough for what we're trying to do. Okay. Uh, I should define what is a morphism of affine varieties. So it's a function from the set X to the set Y such that uh, phi upper star, so this goes from the algebra of functions on y to the algebra of functions on x, taking function f from y to k to f composed with phi, that's a function from x to k. Okay, so this is something totally general, um, any set map f any set map phi from x to y, you can always define this phi star from functions on y to functions on x, and that's automatically an algebra homomorphism for those pointwise operations. Uh, so what's a morphism of affine varieties? It's a set map such that this guy phi star takes the coordinate algebra of y, which is, remember, a subalgebra, into the coordinate algebra of x, which, remember, is a subalgebra of the maps from x to k. So that's the definition of a morphism of affine varieties. It's automatic, continuous for the Zariski topology. I'm not going to prove any of these things. Uh, and, and normally you call uh, phi star so that's the restriction of my phi star up above. Uh, for an affine variety, it go, it, it's an algebra homomorphism from the coordinate algebra of y to the coordinate algebra of x. It's usually called the comorphism of phi. For example, let's see... Uh, 
evaluation at x from uh, the coordinate algebra of x to the field, um, that is uh, the comorphism of Uh, I don't know what to call this, let me call it ink x, the inclusion of the point x. So this is for uh, little x in big x. Okay, so if you have any point in an affine variety, uh, that, that the, the, the point itself, that set, that singleton, that's an affine variety with coordinate algebra, just the field, that's affine zero space, points are affine varieties, and the inclusion of a point into X, that is a morphism of affine varieties, and the comorphism of that morphism, that's exactly the evaluation of X homomorphism that we've used before. Okay, so, so uh, that's just a special, silly special case of uh, a, a comorphism, that's, that's the comorphism of the inclusion of a point. Hmm. Okay, so let me see. Uh, it's very important to realize that you can recover the set X. You, you can recover phi from phi star. If you have a morphism of affine varieties and you know the comorphism, well, then you can actually recover the morphism phi. Of course, given phi, you can get phi star for free because phi star is defined from phi. But in fact, you can go backwards. Just by knowing phi star, you can recover the original map phi. So let's quickly explain that. So I want to explain how given any algebra homomorphism from k of y to k of x, There's a unique phi from x to y so that the comorphism of phi is theta. So in fact, I'm doing a little bit more here than simply showing you can recover the morphism phi from knowledge of the comorphism. I'm actually showing that every algebra homomorphism of theta from k of y to k of x arises from a unique morphism of affine varieties phi from x to y. So I guess if you're being fancy at this point, you probably might, you might have seen this in, in, in your uh, algebra course. Um, there's actually a contravariant equivalence of categories from the category of affine varieties to the category of uh, finitely generated reduced K algebras and uh, that equivalent sends uh, affine variety X to its coordinate algebra and morphism phi to its comorphism phi star. And that this uh, statement that I just wrote down, given any theta, there's a unique phi with phi star equal to theta. That's the main thing that you have to show to prove that that's an equivalence of categories. Remember, you can recover the set X from the coordinate algebra K of X because of this bijection. The points in the set X are in bijection with the maximal ideals of that coordinate algebra. So that's how you can recover X from the algebra. And I'm showing you now how you can recover phi from phi star. Okay, so all we have to do to, 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 to do this, and this is the last thing I'm gonna do, we have to work out, given a point in x, what's phi of x? Right, so I'm trying to, rec I, I'm starting with this theta and I'm trying to construct this phi. So let's think, let's see if we can, if we can think this through quickly. Uh, let me see. So, um, well, of course, uh, we're looking for this point phi of x in y, but the inclusion of that point into y it's, it, it's, it, this is a, a big tautology. It's the inclusion of x into x and then this function phi that we're after. Uh, and if you take that and you take comorphisms everywhere, 
the comorphism of so i'm i'm uh, taking this side here the comorphism of that that's evaluation at phi of x and on the right hand side i'm taking comorphisms which is a contravariant thing so it switches the order and the comorphism of inc x is ev x and of course phi star that's the theta that we're starting with okay so this this uh, phi of x that i'm looking for uh, it's going to have this property that evaluation at phi of x is going to be evaluation at x composed with theta. But uh, evaluation at x composed with theta, that's an algebra homomorphism from k of y to k. Theta goes from k of y to k of x, and then f x goes from k of x to k. So that's an algebra homomorphism, um, and it's kernel. Because this is an algebra homomorphism onto a field, its kernel is a maximal ideal. And so its kernel is going to be um, uh, it's going to be um, the some maximal ideal in Y for some unique point in Y. Uh, and remember MY, that's the kernel of evaluation at y, that y is phi of x. Ah, so uh, I think if you think that through, I've explained everything um, to justify these statements. And uh, this is the place I'm going to stop today. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I'm going to spend a few more minutes next time reviewing just the last few properties of, of uh, algebraic geometry that we need. Not, not much more. We're nearly there and ready to define algebraic groups uh, next time.